When it comes to making our planet future-proof, innovations are a great asset. But we can also look to the past for inspiration. Welcome to Eco Africa. I am Chris Alems, coming to you from Lagos, Nigeria. And I am Sandra Kahomza Twinovdio, joining you from Kampala, right here in Uganda. On the show, we find out how traditional methods can offer answers to today's problems. So here is a quick look at what we have coming up. How a theatre company in Kenya is changing mindsets and carbon deforestation. Livestock farmers in Ghana turn to sustainable indigenous medicines. And an ice cream cafe exploring authentic African flavours. Tunisia's coastal region is the demographic and economic background of the country. Much of its agriculture is located along the coast too, but climate change has led to severe water shortages. Farmers and locals are desperate for solutions. A traditional system that uses seawater to grow fruits and vegetables could be the way forward. Growing potatoes here is only possible for Ali Garci thanks to a centuries-old farming method known as Ramli, which means on sand. It's unique to this sandy region surrounded by salt water on Tunisia's north coast. Arab settlers returning from Andalusia in the 17th century set up small plots along a saltwater lagoon near the town of Rar El Mel. Ali Garci, a retired teacher and farmer's son, has long fought to keep this farming tradition alive. It relies on the tides to water the crops. The salt water comes in from the Mediterranean with the tide. Once it reaches a certain level, it pushes the thin layer of fresh water up through the firm sandy substrate to reach the roots of the crops. We know that fresh water weighs less, so it always stays above the salt water. So only the fresh water reaches the roots of the crops. The fresh water comes from rainfall in the hills, and that's how the plants are irrigated. We never water them from above, we wouldn't be able to. We don't have any wells here or reservoirs. Ali Garci is preparing furrows ready to plant potatoes. Each plot of land is no more than four meters wide and is surrounded by reeds to protect it from wind and erosion. The natural irrigation system allows the farmers to grow crops all year round. No additional watering is required. And there are other advantages too. No pesticides are needed. The salty soil is a natural deterrent for most pests. The farmers can produce up to 20 tons of potatoes, beans or onions per hectare each year. The vegetables are highly prized for their unique taste. But all the work has to be done by hand. It's tough going and many farmers have given up. Zora Nafef has come to see Ali Garci. She's the president of the local Farming and Fisheries Association. She spent two years working to get the Ramli method certified by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization as a globally important agricultural heritage system. Certification is a key step in upgrading the value of the produce. It will allow farmers to sell it in major supermarkets for a higher price, with a label like the one for other organic food. It's the only way to encourage the farmers to keep going. After all, this is organic food, and it's more expensive to produce than with conventional farming. The acceleration of climate change, along with unregulated urban sprawl and growing tourism infrastructure along the coast, have all affected the area. Now, the water no longer reaches all of the Ramli plots at high tide. When they built the road right through the middle of the lagoon, it was obvious that water coming in from the sea to the lagoon would be blocked. When we complained, the authorities agreed to dig channels under the road to let the water through. But very little water gets through, and that's affected the whole ecosystem on which our farms depend. Apart from stopping such building projects, Zora Nafef wants to know what else could help motivate young people to take up this traditional farming method. 
We're trying to encourage the farmers not to sell their plots. We arrange training courses to show them how they can adapt to the new situation. We're organizing workshops together with the Worldwide Fund for Nature and the UN Development Program. We also give the people subsidies to encourage them to keep farming. The potatoes from Ali Garci's plot show the work is worthwhile. He's hoping to persuade the 300 other farmers in the region to hold fast to the Ramli tradition and preserve their heritage. Kenya has been struggling with drought for decades, and the situation is becoming more and more bleak. Soils there are too dry and too hard to plant crops of vegetables, and the cattle are also dying. That's right, Sandra. Millions of Kenyans are suffering from severe hunger. The crisis is partly due to global warming, but radical deforestation is also to blame. Rather than simply telling people to stop chopping down trees, one collective has developed a creative way to bring about change. The music and festive atmosphere soon attracts a crowd. The Safe Pwani Theatre Group is performing today in Bomani in southern Kenya. The play is about everyday hardship, environmental issues and climate change. It's called Miyongo, that means decades in Swahili. It sweeps through the last 40 years, starting in 1981, when nature here was still intact. But years of deforestation have followed to feed the charcoal industry. What will things look like in the future? Group manager David Kalume takes the audience on a journey. Where did we go wrong, he asks. What can we do differently to ensure the next 10 years will be better? The story ends in the year 2031. It just built people on the, on, on the mirror for them to see that this is exactly what I'm doing. So what can I do? So theatre has been, it's, it's, it's just a reflection of their life. So from the reflection you can understand, you now it's like a mirror. If you have a, something, uh, a dirt on your face, then it's time for you now to try to clear the dirt. So this is exactly what we're doing. Safe Pwani's activists know people here are faced with existential problems. Chaka Majaliwa settled in this village, a two-hour drive from Mombasa with his 50 cattle. But now his herd is dying of starvation. I have to buy the calves milk because their mothers have no milk to suckle them. They don't even have the strength to stand up. They don't have the energy to graze on the field's sparse green. Chaka Majaliwa has to help them up. Today he's assisted by some of David Kalume's actors currently touring the area. We're here because we're working on a program on environment. Mostly what we're doing is looking at community resilience towards climate change. As we can see that uh, the way the patterns are changing, we can see that the climate is not as it was some years back. For one, the dry season is getting longer. Sometimes it doesn't rain for months on end now. The theatre group has invited locals to a workshop to talk about their troubles. The team hopes participants can pass on what they learn here to other villagers. One of them is 68-year-old Kilawa Kitome. If everyone plants trees, it will be good for the environment. Living conditions will be better, and that will keep people healthier. The retired civil servant has planted a range of trees, from casuarinas to blue gum and neem trees. They provide shade and protect the ground from drying out. Locals fell trees to clear the land for agriculture, but that makes the ground even drier, so harvests are poor. They end up resorting to selling charcoal, but that's made from trees, so they're locked in a vicious circle. In the workshops facilitated by parent NGO Safe Kenya, the Safe Pwani team helps locals develop alternatives. After two months of consultations and conversations, the theatre group's latest tour is drawing to a close now. The Safe Kenya NGO aims to boost people's resilience amid the climate crisis and inspire them to find solutions. 
the audience have got the message. I have learned that when we manufacture charcoal, it has many negative effects on our land. Things will change because there will be no more cutting down of trees. And if people get tree seedlings, they will plant them, and the current situation will improve. Kilawa Kitome is also among the audience. His tree planting has often been mocked by his neighbors. Now he's been vindicated. Ank is determined to keep planting new trees and hopes more villagers will follow his lead. It's the only way they can secure their future. One of the big criticisms of modern farming is its emphasis on the widespread use of antibiotics for treating livestock. This can lead to an antibacterial resistance in both animals and people. But what's the alternative? For our next report, we head to northern Ghana, where farmers and scientists are exploring the benefits of a pioneering alternative path. Timbia Gabambil is deworming his herd today. The livestock farmer uses indigenous medicines and herbal remedies, all based on knowledge passed down to him by his grandparents. Here in Nakpasalugu, in Ghana's Upper East region, animals are vulnerable to diseases like goat plague, livestock dysentery, and parasitical infections that cause stomach bloating. They have worms in their stomach that are making them sick. So I have to get mahogany tree bark and mix that with other native herbs and give them several doses over three days. This mixture kills the worms. This knowledge of the medicinal properties of plants and herbs is invaluable, both for the region's farmers and their herds, and for researchers. That's because Timbia Gobambil is part of a major interdisciplinary project to implement ethno-veterinary medicine in Ghana. At the Center for Plant Medicine Research in the town of Mampong Akuapim, not far from the capital Accra, Scientists are investigating the healing properties of native plants. The government originally established the facility to provide alternative health care to local people. Now it's carrying out research into animal health. But the laboratory here has been studying the chemical and pharmaceutical properties of plants for some time now. Our focus was to look out for what is the chemistry of these plants, what is the biological activities of these plants, and relate them with the diseases that these um, farmers or innovators claim to be treating with. In Ghana, 10% of livestock succumb to disease. In a country with few trained veterinarians, farmers often rely on the advice of cattle herders and other locals, who recommend medicines sold in open markets like this one. The unregulated misuse and overuse of antibiotics can lead to high levels of antibiotic residues in animal products, and it can encourage antibiotic resistance, which affects the health of both livestock and people who consume animal products. Meanwhile, 75% of livestock in Ghana are resistant to the antibiotics used to treat them. At the same time, many livestock owners don't trust herbal medicines, which aren't scientifically tested and don't come with a company leaflet and packaging. Once we provide this information where this project is aiming at, that would provide this evidence that this herbal medicines work against the disease that we are working, we are studying, we would be able to prove that these medicines or innovations are good. As a participant in the project, Timbia Gabambil no longer has to rely on the plants in the forest. The project gave him exclusive use of an herb garden. He's one of a selected group of herbalists who are receiving support from the Ethno-Veterinary Medicine Project. On this protected patch of land, he's planting a variety of native plants, including mahogany and oak trees and dawa dawa. 
These plant species are hard to find. There aren't any more of them nearby. That's why the project is helping us to both plant and protect them, so that when we need them, they'll be easily available. <laughs> Native plant gardens are an eco-friendly source of medicines for traditional practitioners like Timur Gbambu. If this project catches on, Ghana could become a forerunner in ethno-veterinary medicine. Food waste is a big issue on our planet. While many people face starvation, others have too much. This inequality needs to be dealt with on a global scale. Absolutely, Chris. Each year, nearly one third of food produced for human consumption is lost or wasted worldwide. In our next report, we head to Germany to see how food waste can at least be transformed into something really useful. Let's find out more. Day-old bread. In Germany, around 1.7 million tons of baked goods are thrown away each year. Some gets fed to animals or turned into biogas, but much ends up rotting away at the dump. For a small bakery like us, it's about 10%, but at industrial bakeries and supermarkets, roughly 30% just gets tossed. But baker Ludovic Gerbois has found a way to recycle his old bread. He does it using the bakery oven's residual heat, so he doesn't waste energy either. The roasted bread is then ground. It's now a valuable commodity, just what Professor Thomas Bruck from Munich's Technical University needs. I brought you fresh supplies, solid and liquid. Thanks, we'll use them for donuts. It's the season. Look what I made for you. Wonderful, I'll take it with me now. Till next time, bye. At the Technical University of Munich, biochemist Mahmoud Mazri has developed a method to extract oil from old bread. First, the ground bread is mixed with an enzyme that transforms the starch into sugar. Later, special yeast fungi will be added that feed off the sugar. The yeast cell will be small at the beginning and it's oval shape. When it starts to eating more sugar, it will be more round and uh, accumulating uh, something, uh, uh, the oil inside some small bodies called lipid bodies. We have now oil. Then the next step will be to destroy that cell wall and get the oil out. People have been employing this method for close to a century, though they needed toxic solvents to access the oil. Then Masri discovered an enzyme that cuts open the cell walls of the yeast, the enzyme derived from a mushroom. This enzyme is completely non-toxic. The goal of his research is to find an eco-friendly alternative to palm oil. It's used in almost every product. Every two product on the shelf, the one of them contain palm oil in a certain ingredient. And to find alternatives that cannot affecting or result in uh, deforestation more, uh, that's the main interest of uh, the process. Palm oil is both heat resistant and inexpensive. Some 77 million tons of it are produced each year. That's what makes palm oil the top-selling vegetable oil on the world market, ahead of soya and rapeseed. But palm oil is only cheap in financial terms. The cost to people and the environment is high. Oil palms mainly grow in tropical regions. There, large swathes of rainforest are chopped down to accommodate them, contributing to climate change. By contrast, land is not required to produce yeast oil. All it takes is a fermentation tank, like the ones used to make beer. And it works with things other than old bread. We are completely self-sufficient when it comes to raw materials. We can use almost any food waste, including rice, cassava, sweet potatoes and corn. You can use all of the plant, not just the edible parts, even the corn stalks. The solid yeast oil tastes very mild, so it can be used in almost anything. 
The bakery where Ludovic Gerboin works can meet its need for fats almost entirely with day-old bread. But how could other bakeries benefit from this discovery? Several bakeries could group together to buy a fermentation tank and see how much yeast oil they can produce from their leftover bread. That way the risk isn't so great. And at some point everyone might be able to use their old bread to make French fries at home. Why not? Ludovic Gerboin uses the fresh yeast oil to make a special treat. The recycled oil is used in the dough, glaze and filling of the chocolate brioche. So if you're going to succumb to temptation, at least do it sustainably. Wow, that really looks very delicious. Our next report is also about food, but something very different. Now, who doesn't really love ice cream? And most of us have a favorite flavor. Mine is the strawberry flavor. But I don't think I would actually find this in that cafe in Cape Town, South Africa, where we are heading to next. So let's take a look at that report. Welcome to Tapi Tapi, a place where we celebrate Africa through handmade, hand churned ice cream. If you're craving an old fashioned chocolate strawberry or nutty ice cream cone, you're looking in the wrong place. Here at Tappy Tappies, the ice cream flavors are inspired by African superfoods like tiger nut, sorghum and kai apple. This little ice cream shop in Cape Town's alternative boho observatory suburb is no longer a hidden gem just for locals. Tapiwa changes the flavors every week and they're anything but vanilla. So today I'm making carpenter fish and toffee actually. So this is a little fish that you get in uh, continental Africa, you get in Congo, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, a bit of West Africa as well. Typically people wash out or rinse out the saltiness, um, but in this context we're actually using the saltiness to provide flavor for the ice cream. So you get toffee, caramel, uh, salty kind of vibes. The name Tapi Tapi is a play on Guzu's first name, but it also means sweet sweet in his mother tongue Shona. The 36-year-old molecular biologist loves to play with different flavors. So far, the Zimbabwean has created more than 600, each one more unique than the last. Tapiwa sees his ice cream as an ode to the African continent. In a cup of Tapi Tapi, you are definitely going to go across the continent and enjoy a full range of what the continent has offered in terms of flavors. And I like celebrating the similarities and highlighting and celebrating the differences we have as uh, people on the continent as well. Yeah. So you find ingredients from all over Africa being used in different ways by different people. So we're talking like egusi, hibiscus, dawa, prekese, uh, laho, injera, like it's endless, yeah. So if it's something from the continent, probably I'm gonna try to put it into ice cream at some point, yeah. What started out as a hobby has now become Tapiwa's full-time job and passion. By creating an Afrocentric menu while disrupting traditional food culture, he wants to spark a dialogue about Africa's diverse history and lifestyle and decolonize the mindset of Cape Town's foodies. So I'm interested in creating conversation around going back to the foods that evolved with the people and the land of this continent over the thousands and many thousands and tens of thousands of years. What's often the case on the continent is we take moments to be black, but the rest of our lives is very European, or are very European. Um, so the way we dress, um, the foods we consume, the foods we farm and export, it's really important to me that people embrace their local identity. But what does ice cream made out of dried fish actually taste like? I can taste like the saltiness of the fish as well as like the rich sweetness and the butteriness from like the caramel and the toffee. It's like a familiar flavor but then with a twist. I like the whole idea of like decolonizing and moving back into the home indigenous flavors, indigenous tastes, tastes that are from home. Decolonizing food culture and making Africans proud of their own culinary history and identity. That's what Tapiwa Guze stands for. And he's got plenty of ideas up his sleeve. Beer and liquor are next on his experiment list. 
Well, that has certainly given me food for thought and I hope it has for you as well. That's it for this week's edition of Eco Africa. Thank you for watching. I am Sandra Kahomza Twinobrio signing off from Kampala right here in Uganda. Bye Sandra. See you again next week. And to all our viewers out there, if you have any ideas on how to make our planet a better place with or without the help of traditional insights, then write and share them with us. We love hearing from you. I am Chris Alems, signing off from Lagos, Nigeria. Yeah.